Chapter 7, Scuba Search. As the cry of Stop Thief was repeated, Nancy, Bess, and George raced into the great barn. At the same moment, they saw the girl who resembled Nancy. She was darting in and out among the sightseers, but Nancy caught sight of her dropping a purse into a shopping bag she carried. The girl's own bag hung over her arm. She's the one! George exclaimed to the people around her and put on a burst of speed to catch the thief. As Nancy started to follow, she was jolted to a full stop by two hands that grabbed her shoulders from behind. She turned to face her accoster, a red-faced, angry woman. Seizing one of Nancy's wrists in a crushing grip, she shrieked, Here she is! She's the one! She stole my purse! Bess, just behind Nancy, yanked the woman's hands away. What do you think you're doing? She asked, her eyes flashing. My friend Nancy Drew is not a thief. By this time, a crowd had gathered around the group. A guard pushed his way through to confront them. What's going on here? He demanded. This girl stole my purse, the woman cried out. Arrest her. Make her give me back my money. Where's the bag? The guard asked Nancy sternly. I don't have it, she replied. Evidently, the thief resembles me very strongly. She got away, but a friend of mine has gone after her. The guard looked as if he was not sure whom to believe. Bess kept insisting that Nancy had nothing to do with the theft. At that moment, George returned. I didn't catch her, she said. That girl jumped into a car on the road. The driver, no doubt, was waiting for her. It went racing off. What did the girl look like? The guard asked her. Very much like my friend here, and she had on similar clothes, George answered. Nancy had observed this herself and wondered whether the thief had been shadowing her. Had she deliberately planned the theft to embarrass Nancy and also give herself a chance to get away? To the guard, Nancy said, You've heard the vacation hoax story, of course. He nodded. Well, she went on, that girl is no doubt the same one who took this woman's purse. The victim had been staring hard at Nancy. Now, she said, I can see the difference in the two of you. You're very pretty and you have a kind face. That other girl is very hard looking. I'm sorry I accused you. I'm glad we got things straightened out, Nancy replied. The guard suggested that the woman come to the museum office and tell her story to the police, whom he would summon. The crestfallen victim followed him. I'm glad that's over, Bess remarked. For a few minutes, I was afraid you were going to land at police headquarters, Nancy. To tell the truth, her friend answered with a little grin. I was too. George reminded the others that they had been on their way to look at the Cardiff giant. Come along, she urged. I want to see that moth-eaten Indian. The girls went outdoors and hurried to the large shed beneath which the giant lay. The three girls stared at it and burst out laughing. That yo and his moth-eaten Indian, Bess said. The only thing about this being a giant is his size. He's just carved out of wood and pretty crudely at that. He has an Indian face, though. Nancy read a sign tacked to the wall. It explained that the Cardiff giant had been a hoax perpetrated many, many years before. A man had carved the figure, then buried it on a farm in Cardiff, New York, to age the wood. Finally, he had dug it up. The man had publicized the giant widely as having been carved in ancient times by Indians. His story caught on so well that he and a partner had traveled all over the country exhibiting their prehistoric Indian figure. Newspapers and various periodicals had run stories about the Cardiff giant, and the men had made thousands of dollars before the hoax was discovered. After Bess had read the sign, she said indignantly, Why, that faker! He was nothing but a thief! The girls moved off and went to buy the old-fashioned candy. 
After some more sightseeing, they returned to the parking area. As they drove through the exit gate, Yo was waiting for them. He wore a broad grin and called, How did you like the withered old Indian? George opened the door to let Yo in and replied, You old fraud, you. I guess I'll have to give you credit for really fooling us this time. One good hoax deserves another, I suppose. Yo laughed and said, What you doing this afternoon? If I tell you, said Nancy, are you going to play another joke on us? He laughed and she added, We're going swimming. They dropped him off in town. On the way home, Nancy decided his mysterious smile at the dock yesterday might have indicated he liked to play jokes. The instant the girls arrived at Bidawee, they thanked Miss Drew for her secret invitation to the boys. Bess added, Tell us what to do to help get ready for them and we'll start. Oh, tomorrow we'll do. Why don't we all go swimming? You can try out your scuba equipment and hunt for the child's coach. Great idea, Nancy agreed. I keep wondering, if we do find it, what condition the box will be in. Maybe it is disintegrated and floated away. Yes, Bess added. And the coach could be a sorry sight after lying in water a couple of hundred years. Nancy said if this were true, Miss Armitage would be very much disappointed. And I will, too. Well, let's get started. In a short time, Aunt Eloise and her guests were swimming in Mirror Bay. The girls began hunting for the child's Russian royal coach. They found many small items in the sand, the shale and the mud, but nothing of importance until Nancy signaled the cousins to take a look at something. They swam over quickly. Their detective friend was tugging at the wheel of an object embedded in the mud. The three girls moved it gently from side to side so as not to break the wheel off the article to which it was attached. After several seconds, they unearthed a child's rusted stroller and brought it to the surface. Its wicker sides were gone. When it lay on the beach, Bess looked at it, frowning. Don't tell me this was once a beautiful gold and white coach. George laughed. It's as bad as Cinderella's coach turning into a pumpkin. Aunt Eloise looked amused. I'd say this stroller is about 50 years old, but hasn't been in the water over six months. Somebody probably threw it out as junk. The girls decided they had searched enough for this session, and everyone went to dress, disappointed at another failure. They came outside again, just in time to witness a gorgeous sunset across the water. Let's take a sunset sail, Bess proposed. Great idea, Nancy agreed. Suppose you and George go out first, then I'll take Aunt Eloise while you cousins get supper. That was a neat trick, George commented. Nevertheless, I'll say okay. Come on, Bess, let's go. She and Bess returned in about 20 minutes, Then Nancy and Aunt Eloise set off. Miss Drew worked the stick while Nancy manned the sheet. Enough breeze had sprung up, so they were able to sail almost halfway to Cooperstown. They tacked back and pulled up to the dock of Mirror Bay Bidewee. Something smells wonderful, Aunt Eloise remarked. Bess must be preparing one of her favorite recipes. The appetizing dish turned out to be cheese souffle, served with tiny ham sandwiches, corn on the cob, and tomato salad. After everyone had eaten, Bess called out, Anyone for dessert? I'm stuffed, George admitted. Aunt Eloise smiled. I'm sure whatever you have planned will be delicious. Why don't we wait until later in the evening? Maybe an early midnight snack. All agreed, but Bess refused to divulge what the dessert was. A little later, they went to sit on the porch. By this time, it was dusk, and as usual, the fireflies began to flit about. Have you ever noticed, Aunt Eloise asked, that most of the fireflies turn their lights on and off in unison? These are the males. The females refuse to follow this practice and flash on their little lanterns whenever they please. It's sort of a flirtation. The girls laughed, and Aunt Eloise went on to explain 
that entomologists say that this custom makes it easy for a male to find a mate. Nancy spoke up. What a perfect night for trying to find luminescent mushrooms for Karen. Why don't we climb the mountain right now and see if we can find any? They might even be in a cave. I've read that mushrooms thrive in damp caves. George added eagerly, I just remembered something I learned about luminescent mushrooms or some kind of fungi growing in the jungle. It seems that during wartime, Japanese soldiers used to rub the palms of their hands with this phosphorescent material and could read a letter or military order by holding their hands over the sheet. How amazing, Bess said. She was not particularly keen about going on the trek because of the green man, but since her friends were making the climb, she felt compelled to go along. Nancy felt no alarm and tried to reassure Bess. The trekkers took flashlights, but did not turn them on. The fireflies lighted their way. Aunt Eloise suggested that they not talk and attract attention, so the group climbed in silence, looking for the luminescent mushrooms. They saw none. In a little while, Nancy and her friends approached the area where they had encountered the green man. There was no sign of him, and they heard no voice. Bess had just begun to feel secure against danger when suddenly she grabbed Nancy's arm in a gesture of fright. End of chapter seven. <laughs>